If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 8. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to, Mark chapter 8. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Prince William and Arlington and Loudoun, Montgomery County, as well as others online. It's good to be together around God's Word. And man, this part of Mark that we have been in the last few weeks has been so good in ways I didn't see coming, certainly in ways I didn't plan. So if you you missed any of the last few weeks, a a few weeks ago, we started in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, story of Jesus healing a blind man, and thought about the healing power of Jesus and prayed for healing in each other's lives and celebrated healing specifically in marriages in our church family. And then the next week, we looked at the part God gives us to play in seeing healing happen in other people's lives. And we heard stories of women and men and teenagers doing all kinds of ministry in Jesus' name with refugees and students and individuals and families in need. And then last week, we contemplated the miracle that happens when God opens any one of our eyes to see who Jesus is. And we heard stories from elder nominees that we're voting on today, which I would remind you, if you are a member of this church and haven't voted on elders, please do that before uh, one o'clock today. But last week we heard stories, just praise God for the different ways He opens our eyes to see who Jesus is. And now, today, this story of Jesus healing a blind man is going to keep on giving in ways that I trust are going to challenge and encourage you. So let's dive in. Last week, I asked the question, who do you say Jesus is? And we talked about how your answer to that question, right, where you're sitting right now, will determine your life today, this week, how you live this week and your life for all of eternity. And I mentioned last week that many of you may be new to church, maybe even visiting for the first time, and you've never seen who Jesus is. And I said last week, I'd say it again, I I pray that today might be the day when God opens your eyes, maybe in a way you weren't expecting, to see who Jesus is. But then I mentioned that there are others of you I'm convinced many others who have been around church for a long time, maybe even most of your life, but you still haven't seen who Jesus really is. You've seen, maybe even put your faith in, a picture of Jesus that's either inaccurate or at best incomplete. And you desperately need God God to open your eyes, maybe for the first time, or maybe in a fresh way, to who Jesus really is. Because, again, your life this week and your life forever depends on it. So let me show you what I mean. We've started the last few weeks in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. We're going to start there again, the healing of Jesus Uh, the blind man. And we've talked each week about how this man's physical sight was restored in two stages, a very unique miracle in the stories of Jesus. So today I want to show you why this two-stage healing is so important for your spiritual sight, right, where you are sitting. So let's read it one more time. If you don't have a Bible, I'll have it up here on the screen. And this will hopefully bring everybody up to speed if you've missed the last couple weeks. It says in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought to Jesus a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hand on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. So, 
very plainly, this man goes from not being able to see at all to being able to see in part to being able to see perfectly. And we know this story is symbolic of spiritual sight because earlier in the chapter, Jesus used the same language to talk about how his disciples were spiritually blind. They couldn't see. They needed their eyes open to see who Jesus is. So what happens next? Verse 27, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now, we talked last week about how this was a very significant moment. Up until this point, only God and demons had acknowledged Jesus for who he is, as the Son of God, or specifically here as Christ, which means Messiah, the one God had promised to come and save his people for centuries. This is the first time in the book of Mark that a disciple says who Jesus is. And we're thinking, yes, they get it. They see Jesus. And they do in part. But read what happens next. So now we're getting into new territory that we haven't gone into yet. As this story continues to unfold, verse 31 says, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And Jesus said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So apparently Peter and the disciples didn't get it. They had confessed Jesus as the Christ, but their understanding of what that means was still unclear. Kind of like a blind man who could see in part, but still needed to see more clearly. Now we're going to pick up in a second with what happens next, but let's pause here and let's think about the problems with the disciples' spiritual sight because I think it's possible for us to have the same spiritual sight problems in our lives. So when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter said on behalf of the apostles, or the disciples, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Let's think about what was going through their minds when they said the Christ, the Messiah. So if you're taking notes, Might write down at this point who the disciples wanted Jesus to be, who Jewish men and women wanted a Messiah to be. They wanted someone who would, on one hand, save their nation politically. Jewish people were longing for a political Messiah who would deliver Jerusalem and Israel from the Gentiles, specifically the Romans at this time, and make their nation great. Second, they wanted someone who would give them power, who would overthrow their oppressors with military might, give them the power they desired. They wanted someone who would make them prosperous, who would restore their wealth and comfort and prosperity in their lives and their families and their nation. Keep going, a couple more things. They wanted someone who would draw the crowds together who would bring all the leaders and the priests and the scribes and the common men and women all together under one banner to overthrow their enemies. And in all of this, here's the last thing to note. They wanted someone who would not demand their lives, meaning they wanted to continue on with their lives as they knew them, only better, with more prosperity and more power in this world. So this is who... Jewish people would have had in their minds when they thought about the disciple, when they thought about the Messiah. So for these Jewish disciples in Mark 8, at this significant point in time, they were saying, Jesus, you're him. This is who you are. But their sight was what? It was inaccurate. 
It was incomplete. But lest we be too hard on them, let's just pause and ask the question, is it possible for us to want the same things? I would submit that as you look at this list, if we're not careful, this can actually be American Christianity today. We can seem pretty zealous to find a political savior for our nation. We can do all kinds of things in pursuit of worldly power. We have created and exported to the whole world a version of Christianity that revolves around worldly prosperity. The prosperity gospel, the good news that you can be prosperous in this world with Jesus. There seems to be little difference practically between how Christians and non-Christians approach possessions and comforts in this world. And hasn't the name of the game in American churches been do whatever it takes to draw the crowds, often to the point of diluting what it means to follow Christ? So maybe it's not just these disciples. Maybe it's us. Maybe it's you and me today who together with these disciples need to see Jesus more clearly. So together, let's open our eyes in this passage to who Jesus really is. And to be clear, the Bible teaches he is not one who will make this nation or that nation great. Jesus is the savior of all the nations. Did you notice where all this is taking place in Caesarea Philippi? A city originally called Panaeus in honor of the Roman god Pan, whose shrine was located there. The population of Caesarea Philippi was mainly Gentile, non-Jewish, actually hostile to Judaism. And this is the place that Jesus has first proclaimed the Messiah, the deliverer, not just of the Jewish people, but of all peoples. He is not just for one nation. He is for all the nations. And contrary to seeking worldly power, Jesus is the humble son of man. Did you see it in verse 31? Right after they confess him as the Christ, the Bible says Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man. So he doesn't use this title, Messiah, to refer to himself. He knows what's in their mind when they're using that word. So he switches to talking about himself as the Son of Man, a title that emphasizes both his humanity and his humility. And think about it. Did you notice Right after both of these stories, the healing of the blind man and the confession of the disciples, what happened? In both stories, Jesus said, don't tell anyone about me. Remember, he told the blind man, do not even enter the village with his disciples. They said, you are the Christ. He strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Why is that? Because he didn't want what was in their minds spreading anywhere. If Jesus was on a quest for worldly power, he would be leveraging these healings to his advantage, right? He'd be telling his disciples, the spy men, go and tell everybody else who I am. Get the crowds coming. Instead, he's turning the crowds away. He's the humble son of man who must suffer. Jesus is the suffering servant. This is astounding. Jesus is saying, I've not come to seize our enemies. I've come to suffer at the hands of our enemies. And not just the Romans and the Gentiles. I've come to endure suffering from the Jewish people, from those on the inside. Keep going. Jesus is despised by the crowds. He says he will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and the scribes, all the leaders of the Jewish people will totally reject him. And not just reject him, but kill him. He is the king who will conquer by being killed. And this was unthinkable to Jewish disciples. A Messiah who will suffer and be killed, that's the exact opposite of what they had in their minds when they thought of the Christ. 
Which is why, think about it, the audacity of Peter to pull Jesus aside and rebuke him. Like the word there for rebuke, same word that we've seen in other parts of Mark when demons are silenced. Peter is trying to shut Jesus up. He is ruining Peter's plans. And look at the language. Jesus turns and what does he do? He sees his disciples. He sees them for what they really think. And he looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. What language. Follow this. It is demonic to look to Jesus as one who will save your nation politically, give you power, make you prosperous, draw the crowds while demanding nothing from your lives. That picture of Jesus comes straight from hell. And the danger is it's appealing to us, just like it was to them. Because if Jesus was the Messiah they wanted, they could have the nation they wanted. They could have the power and prosperity they wanted. They could have the crowds they desired, and they could have the lives they wanted to live. But Jesus came, watch this, Jesus came to give them something better than all of that. And he came to give you and me something better than all of this. Listen to the Savior of the nations, the humble Son of Man and suffering servant who came to die on a cross and rise from the grave. Listen to what he says next, verse 34. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Do you see it? Do you see who Jesus really is? And do you see what it really means to follow him? Write this down, three things, because these three things go totally against the grain of the way they thought and totally against the grain of the way we think. One, to follow Jesus means you die so you can live. To live, you have to die. That's what Jesus is saying. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That doesn't just mean a burden to bear, like this is the cross I have to bear. No, people who heard those words in the first century knew exactly what Jesus was saying. The cross was an instrument of death. In order to follow him, you have to die. And Jesus is taking things to a whole other level here. He's not just talking about how he must die. He's talking about how anyone who follows him must die. Jesus is saying, you cannot follow me and hold on to your life. Are you hearing this? You are not following Jesus if you are holding on to your life. And here's the danger. We've created a whole Christian culture that says you are. We've created a whole Christian culture that says Christianity is a both and. You can have Christ and your life as you want it. But it's not true. That's not Christianity. That's a false message that revolves around a false Messiah. Jesus says it's either or. It's either your life or my life. Which do you choose? And if you're going to live in me, you have to die to you. You have to trust me with your entire life. This is Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I don't even live anymore. 
But contrast, Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Christian life is the Christ life. I'm dead. You're dead. Christ is alive in you, which means whatever he wants, I want. Whatever he wants me to be, I will be. Wherever he wants me to go, I will go. Whatever he calls me to give, I will give. No matter the cost, Jesus is my life. I died to me. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It means you die so you can live. Which means, keep going, it means you choose the suffering that comes with obedience over the comfort that comes with disobedience. Jesus is clearly preparing his disciples here for suffering. Not to seek suffering, but to know that as they followed Jesus, suffering would come. And most of the people who read the book of Mark in the first century were facing persecution, potentially even death for following Jesus. They would read these words from Jesus, whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will save it. They knew exactly what that meant. Jesus was calling them to be ready in that moment of persecution, maybe even facing death, to choose the suffering that comes with obedience over the comfort that comes with disobedience. That's a choice that many of our brothers and sisters around the world have today, whether in North Korea, Somalia, Yemen, Pakistan, a variety of places in the world. For most of us, within the sound of my voice right now though, we likely won't face persecution or death in the same way. But there are scores of ways this may still play out in our lives. Some of you have jobs that will be more and more in jeopardy as you profess biblical convictions. And following Jesus may mean losing your job by holding fast to your convictions instead of keeping your job and compromising your convictions. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Others of you, with three billion people in the world who have little to no knowledge of the gospel, God may lead you to take a job somewhere else in the world, maybe among unreached people. And it will not be easy for you to do that, to move your life, your family there instead of staying here. But if that is the way God is leading you, then following Jesus means moving in obedience, not staying in disobedience. I think of many people in our church family right now who are in the process of considering this. Others who have gone to other places and join in from online in the middle of a really challenging places and circumstances in the world. Choosing the suffering that comes with obedience. Or I should add, those whom God calls to stay here, for all of us who are here right now, whom God is calling to make financial sacrifices to support the spread of the gospel among the unreached. To choose to put aside comforts in this world for the spread of the gospel to people who've never heard it. To choose whatever means to let go of for the sake of obedience to the Great Commission. Or we read James 1.27 in our Bible reading just a couple of weeks ago. Religion that God our Father looks at as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. God is calling us to care for children in need, for widows in need, both of which will require a sacrifice of comfort in our lives. If you pursue foster care or adoption, you are signing up for a road full of unknowns, but following Jesus means you obey regardless of what that means. The same will be true when you step into caring for widows in need, and not just orphans and widows. So we've talked about caring for refugees, caring for the imprisoned, caring for the impoverished and oppressed and enslaved. We will not do justice in this world according to God's word if our priority is comfort for ourselves. We just won't. The reality is, the more we actually follow Jesus for who he really is, the harder our lives will get in this world. Jesus told us this 
It's what he was telling his disciples here. You will experience suffering. You will experience slander. You will experience hardship. You will experience opposition from all sides, inside and outside. But following me me, means choosing suffering that comes with obedience over comfort that comes with disobedience. Which leads to the last thing Jesus says here about what it really means to follow him. It means you gladly renounce prosperity and applause in this world for prosperity and applause in the world to come. Jesus says in Mark 8, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? That's a lot. To have it all, the whole world, every, everything that belongs to Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, and you're just getting started. All of it, all the possessions, All the glamour, all the success, all the fame, everything you could want or imagine in this world, everything Northern Virginia has to offer, everything Montgomery County has to offer, everything Washington, D.C., the United States has to offer, you can have it all only to realize that none of these things will last. None of them will. Do you you see this? Because we live in a world that tells us every day, you're getting bombarded with messages every day. Having things in this world is life, but it's a lie. All the things of this world put together, the whole world, you can have it all and you'll lose your life. Don't spend your life, don't raise your kids to have it all. Don't do it. You'll waste your life, you'll waste their lives. Open your eyes and realize Jesus is life. He's life. Nothing in this world is worthy of your attention like Jesus. Nothing in this world is worthy of your affection, your pursuit, your longing like Jesus. So don't live for worldly prosperity. Worldly applause, renounce these things. Jesus says, for whoever, listen to the language, is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Jesus says, don't spend your life getting praise from people in a world that's set against God. That's not life, that's death. I hear this, teenagers. What other people think about you in this world is not what leads to life for you. Getting to think this or that about you, it's not life. Jesus is lovingly saying to you right now, I came to give you real life, not in the prosperity and applause of this world. None of that will last. I came to give you life that will never, ever end, will never, ever fade, that will never, ever, ever let you down. So hear him, teenager, college student, young professional, with all the world before you. Hear him, man or woman, in your 30s, 40s, 50s. Hear him, senior adults. See him. See the choice every one of us has. You can live for stuff in this world that's going to fade away and for the applause of people in this world who are ultimately in a world that's set against God. Or you can live for treasure that will never, ever fade for the next 10 trillion years, and you can live for the applause of Jesus and the Father and millions of holy angels. And Jesus is saying, choose life. John Piper said in a sermon on this text, who's the real lover of life here? Jesus is pleading with you, don't throw your life away. Follow me. Don't believe the lie that 80 years of human praise and physical pleasures are better than 8 million ages of years with fullness of joy and uninterrupted, undiminished, unparalleled pleasures at the right hand of God. Amen. I just be smart. So here's the deal. I was thinking, much like the last few weeks, of who, how we might illustrate what we're seeing here. And all kinds of people started coming to my mind who've died to themselves and who are following Jesus in a lot of the ways I mentioned earlier. And then I thought about a brother who I met just a few weeks ago here at Tyson's who was here in support of some teenagers who were family friends who were being baptized. 
His name is Kelvin Cochran, and I want to invite him to join me out here. He's actually a member of a sister church, uh, First Baptist Glen Arden in Maryland, where John Jenkins is pastor. And you may have heard about this brother a couple of years ago um, in the news when he was a fire chief in the city of Atlanta. But I'll back up for a second. Would you welcome Chief Cochran with me? All right, brother, let's start the best place. When did God open your eyes to see who Jesus is? So just a little bit of your spiritual background. Well, good morning. I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, into a family where I had three big brothers and two little sisters. Um, We were very poor. Uh, My dad left my mother, and we could no longer afford to live in the projects that we were living in, so my mother moved us a few blocks over into a rear alley called Rear Snow Street into a shotgun house. And at the top of the alley, there was a church called the Galilee Baptist Church. And we joined the Galilee Baptist Church and we began to go to church every Sunday morning and Sunday school after that, go to church Sunday evening and uh, Baptist training union after that. Uh, In the summers, we went to vacation Bible school. And by the time I reached seven, I had learned enough about Jesus to where there was a spring revival and the invitation was extended one night after the preacher had preached and I went to the altar, confessed Christ as my savior uh, and have been on this journey of faith ever since that time. Praise God for spring revival at Mount Galilee Baptist Church. Uh, Okay, as a child, You had a dream to fight fires. Tell us a little bit about that. It was in that same alley. Again, at five years old, Miss Maddie, who lived across the alley from us, her house caught fire. And the Shreveport firefighters came that day. And as my mom, brothers and sisters, and me, we were watching the firefighters, I was so overwhelmed by what they were doing. I looked at my mom and brothers and sisters, and I said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And the grown-ups in those days taught us this. They said, all of your dreams are going to come true if you believe in and have faith in God, if you go to school and get a good education, if you respect grown-ups and treat other people like you want to be treated. They said, all your dreams are going to come true. And they were right. I did those things growing up as a kid. And in 1981, my childhood dream came true. I became a Shreveport firefighter. But God didn't stop there. The favor of God was on my career. And so four years later, I became a captain in the training division of the Shreveport Fire Department. Six years after that, with 10 years on the job, I became the assistant chief of the training division. And eight years after that, with 18 years on the department, I became the fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department. Eight years after that, I was appointed fire chief of the city of Atlanta under one mayor, Served her for two years. President Obama was elected and appointed me to head the United States Fire Administration within the Department of Homeland Security, the highest fire official in the United States of America. (laughs) But during that year, Atlanta elected a new mayor who came to Washington, D.C., and recruited me back to the city of Atlanta. So I went back to Atlanta after one year of serving under President Obama, and I served there faithfully for five years. All right, so <laughs> I've got to mention, last night I was, uh, we were out in our backyard uh, with some kids, uh, my kids and their friends, and we were roasting marshmallows over the fire, and I was just like, if this goes awry, I'm going to feel so bad for so many reasons, but especially (laughs) talking to you today. So all of that career then led you, okay, so you were chief of the fire department in Atlanta, and and then you had, along the way, written a men's Bible study, and uh, what you had done in writing that men's Bible study ended up intersecting with your career in a way you didn't see coming. Tell us about that. Well, the story didn't end the way I just ended that first part of the story. Uh, When I was serving in Atlanta as fire chief, I joined the Elizabeth Baptist Church, faithfully serving in the men's ministry there. And I was uh, conducting a small group's men's Bible study called The Quest for Authentic Manhood. 
And one of the classes was talking about God's purpose for man, and we started with Adam. And I asked the men, are men today still suffering from the consequences of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden? Of course, all Christian men, they said yes, and they began to share stories of the struggles they were having in their carnal nature. And while they were talking, the question asked, God asked Adam in the garden just kept repeating itself over and over again in my head. That question was, who told you that you were naked? And so I began to search that question to find out, was God asking Adam more than who told you that you don't have on any clothes? And it led to a lot of research and a lot of uh, good Bible teaching, and I shared it with the men, and God said, you need to publish this so other men can be blessed by it. Well, in the book, I began to address challenges that some of the men were speaking about, and one of them was sexual sin. So I thought it would be appropriate to talk about God's purpose for sex, where he made them male and female, and he joined them together in holy matrimony, and they became one flesh because God wanted a whole bunch of sons and daughters. And uh, that sex outside of that intention by God uh, was sin. And after the book was published for a year, uh, a brother who I had embraced as a brother who was the union president thought it would be a good idea to show those few paragraphs about what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality to an openly gay Atlanta City Council member. He was offended by what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality. He complained to my boss, the mayor, and the mayor terminate, terminated me after 35 years of faithful service in the fire service and five faithful years serving him uh, and the city of Atlanta. So this is why uh, I had heard Chief Cochran's story, and some of you may have as well. When he was here a few weeks ago celebrating baptism uh, here, some family friends, we were talking, and I, I know across our church family, I have many conversations with different ones of you who are walking through similar challenges, whether you are in teaching, and government, and, and so many different areas where there are challenging uh, decisions that you make and uh, challenges you face because you're holding to biblical convictions and there's temptation to compromise those convictions. And so, Chief Cochran, what would you say to our church family having walked through what you've walked through um, to encourage us to hold fast to our convictions. After I was terminated, I discovered that there was a Christian law firm called Alliance Defending Freedom. And I didn't know it, there was such a thing as a Christian law firm. But Alliance Defending Freedom <laughs> came to my aid and they took on my case. And after a four year legal journey, uh, my case was won and settled, and God vindicated me because in the United States of America, we have a uh, First Amendment that gives us the freedom to live out our faith without the fear of consequences. And so I was vindicated. But God shared with me five things that he wanted me to share with the body of Christ because it's not a matter of if you will face that test, it's a matter of when. And I want to share quickly those five things that God taught me to share with his sons and daughters. The first thing, brothers and sisters, is that when you face that moment, realize that God has prepared you for that moment. It is not a pop quiz. I realized when I faced that test that God had been preparing me for that my entire life. So, number one, God always prepares his sons and daughters for that test. Number two is the toughest of the five things. There are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. It's an occupational hazard in the United States of America today to be openly Christian. So there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. But here's number three. There are kingdom consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ, and the kingdom consequences are always, always greater than the worldly consequences. But the challenge is, sons and daughters of God, particularly in our country, have more fear in the worldly consequences 
than faith in the kingdom consequences that Jesus has promised. Hmm. Jesus said, whatever you lose standing for me, I'll restore it 100 fold, which is 100 times greater. And I'm living proof of that. I lost my job as the fire chief, but I was immediately hired as the chief operating officer at Elizabeth Baptist Church. So I was still a chief. <laughs> and five years into that, just when I thought it couldn't get any better, last summer, the same Christian law firm that defended my case hired me on staff. Now I serve as the senior vice president of human resources and faith initiatives for Alliance Defending Freedom. It just keeps on getting better and better and better. I lost friends, but I have a hundredfold friends that God has restored mm. in replace of those friends. And here's the fourth thing that I've learned. God is glorified when his sons and daughters have the courage and grace to stand in two ways. The, work, the first way is our persecutors get to see a side of God that they would not have seen had we not stood. Remember the story of the three Hebrew guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their persecutor, Nebuchadnezzar. When he put them in the fiery furnace, he looked in there and he said, I thought we put three in there. I see four, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. He would not have ever seen that had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not stood. The other part is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got to see the Son of God. They would not have seen that if they had not stood. When we have the courage and grace to stand, we get to see a side of God that we would never see if we bow down. Mm -hmm. Here's the last thing, is when we have the courage and grace to stand, our life of blessing goes to a level exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Remember Job, his, he was restored twice as much as he lost. Remember the story of Joseph, he ultimately became the prime minister of Egypt. Remember David at his suffering, at ch Saul chasing him for 14 years? He actually became the king of Israel. Remember Ruth, who actually ended up being uh, the wife of uh, Boaz? Remember Esther, who actually was the queen who inherited the estate of Haman? Remember Jesus, who now suffered but has the name above every name? All I'm trying to say is every single time it happens, the life of who has the courage and grace to stand goes to a whole nother level that they would not have experienced. Mm -hmm. We literally deprive ourselves of greater things when we don't have the courage to stand. And I pray that you will have the courage and grace to stand. Would you, you give Pastor God Dad. glory with me? Thank you, Daddy. Thank you. just one picture of this truth straight from Jesus' mouth. Mark 8, 35. Whoever loses his life, his job, reputation, career, whatever else, for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's true. For my sake and for the gospel, the greatest news in the world, think about this. What you're losing it all for. The one who came and lived the life we couldn't live, a life of no sin against the Father. And then even though he had no sin for which to die, who chose to die on a cross to pay the price for all of our sin, and who, whose story did not stop in a grave, he's the king who conquers by being killed. Three days later, he rises to life, ascends into heaven, and right now by his spirit is calling you to trust in him with your life in a way that will far outlast anything in this world. Even that, like Chief Cocker and I were talking beforehand this morning about persecuted brothers and sisters. 
who serve and suffer and die and don't see the hundredfold here. But that hundredfold is waiting for them in a way that is far beyond what any of us can imagine. Do you believe this? See it. This is how you save your life. By dying to yourself, by choosing the suffering that comes with obedience to Christ over the comfort that comes with disobedience. And by renouncing prosperity and applause in this world for prosperity and applause in the world to come. May God raise up all across this church family, men, women, teenagers who see who Jesus really is, not who we want him to be, and who realize what it really means to follow him, no matter what it costs us in this world, confident in his reward. Let's pray. All across this room, other locations, those of you who are watching online, just bow our heads and close our eyes so that I can ask you this question. You can focus, like, have you seen Jesus for who he really is? Is the one who is worthy not of your church attendance and religious motion while you go on with your life the way you want? Have you seen Jesus as the one who's worthy of your life? I want to invite you to open your eyes to him today, your spiritual eyes, and maybe for the first time or maybe in a fresh way to pray, Jesus, I see you for who you are. Thank you for bringing me to hear this word today from you. And I say, yes, I want to, I want to follow you for who you really are. Forgive me for, like Peter, rebuking you with the way I live my life, holding on to my life, and yet claiming to follow you. Today, right now, I let go of my life. I want to be crucified with you. I don't want to live anymore. I want you to live in me. I trust you to save me from my sin and to be Lord of my life. Oh. Jesus, we praise you for the invitation you've given us to find life in you. And we say together today, we trust in in you and the reward that's found in you. And so we pray that you'd help us to die daily to ourselves. You'd help us to choose suffering that comes with obedience no matter what that means in any one of our lives. And you would help us to live day by day for prosperity and applause in the world to come. May it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.